okay. Yeah. You okay. can do it. Perfect. Thank you. So, um, first, thanks for inviting me for this seminar. What I will present is some recent work uh, that uh, has been uh, one of the key ingredients in convincing uh, many governments right now uh, to take the road uh, on uh, app-based contact tracing. What I will explain here is mostly only the scientific rationale for that. Uh, if you have further questions about the more general context, I will be happy to take them after the, after the talk. But okay. here I will discuss the science behind this idea. First, uh, you all know what COVID-19 is uh, by now. The critical point of COVID-19 is that it is a highly infectious disease with a very high load on the health system. This is the celebrate of a major plot by Neil Ferguson et al. from the Imperial College Report 9, who convinced politicians in the, U the US and UK of the, of the gravity of the situation. And here you see all the famous flatten the curve strategies from uh, do nothing to different levels of social isolation. And here in the, in the red line, you see the actual capacity of the UK in terms of uh, uh, ICU beds. So you see that essentially this, the, the, the critical aspect of this disease is not so much mortality by itself, but it's the fact that it, it grows, it, it, it's, it's so fast that overwhelms the health system, especially the, the amount of critical bed capacity. Uh, therefore, what is needed to control this disease is to dramatically reduce transmission. And that is the reason why I think pretty much all of us are in lockdown right now because the reduction in transmission should be really dramatic in order to make this difference and reduce the curve down to this level. Now, the problem is that being a new disease uh, that just, uh, I mean, the virus was uh, just uh, found out between December and January in Wuhan. So it's really short times uh, in terms both of epidemiologic and genetic studies. And uh, the, the quality of the data that is uh, available is not great uh, because of uh, the crisis and the emergency that have uh, accompanied the, the, the virus itself. So what I'm showing here are different data sets from the early epidemic in China. So this, this is essentially Wuhan. Uh, and the market, uh, the famous fish market uh, from whom uh, the, the first seed of the epidemic originated, possibly not the epidemic itself, but the first super spreading at least, uh, was closed on January 1st, so here. And the whole of uh, Wuhan was essentially put into lockdown on January 23rd, so it's about here. Now, you can see that there are several phases of exponential growth. This is a log scale. So you see exponential growth uh, in different parts of this data. This is, uh, this is essentially cases and this is deaths. And you see that even from this plot, it is not trivial to understand how far the virus is going. It is one of the most basic information that we would like to have. Uh, different, data, different parts of the data have their own biases uh, and uh, the, the doubling time, the time it takes for the epidemic to double number of cases is even in this plot uh, with the, with the, within a, a small time uh, frame, it's varying from 1.6 days to double the number of cases to 8.1. So there is a lot of uncertainty. The value that I prefer for several reasons is this one about deaths, because deaths, uh, these deaths uh, refer basically from the period between the closure of the market and the lockdown of one. So when the virus was, was spreading freely through the population, but the population was, was aware of the presence of the, of the virus. And that's, uh, uh, let's say, that suffer from less ascertainment bias than cases. Cases need to be reported and so on, while deaths uh, usually occur in a controlled way. In, when they are in reasonable, in reasonable number, here we are talking about uh, hundreds of deaths. So it's still a situation that was uh, relatively under control. So if we take this value as a good one, uh, we are talking about, uh, let's say, one week of doubling time. It means that essentially the number of cases doubles every week. It is already a quite uh, fast growth for a virus because it means that essentially in a, in, uh, a couple of months, uh, you have uh, overwhelmed completely the responses of that system. And if you find it 
too late, uh, as it happened in China, and sorry, not, not in China, in, uh, in Hubei and in, in Italy, when the virus has already spread to the population, stopping it is very difficult. Now, in Europe, the situation is uh, worse, if possible. So I, here I'm showing data for all uh, Italian regions, because it has been one of the worst it in, uh, in, in Europe, as you know. Now, if you look, if you look at this uh, dashed line that I'm, I'm showing in these log plots, uh, the plots show hospitalizations plus deaths. So cases that were um, severe enough to be hospitalized or to die. Uh, this dashed line is the growth assumed from, v from the Wuhan epidemic that I just showed you. And you can see that uh, in most of the most hit regions, Emilia Romagna here, so initially, if there, are few, if there are just a few cases, there can be a certain bias. You do not notice, notice the cases, and this is what happened in Italy. But at some point around here, this is an exponential growth in the presence of, uh, of uh, uh, knowledge of the virus among the population. So there is some hint of social distancing. Yet, uh, if you see the speed both in Emilia-Romagna, in Lombardia here, and in Veneto, where it's a very good exponential because there is very little ascertainment in Veneto here, you see the virus is actually growing significantly faster than in Wuhan. So the, the doubling time in Europe is essentially around three days. This is among the most European countries. So that means that it's something that overwhelms the public health systems in a very, very short time, matter of a few weeks. And as you all know, this has been the, the problem. This also means that it's a challenge to contain this virus by itself. Now, containment, to be effective, needs to go through an understanding of what are the possible ways of the virus to spread. There is a lot of discussion about aerosol, droplets, fomites, and so on. But what we wanted to give as a group was an epidemiological classification, something that could be practical in terms of contact tracing. And uh, uh, there are uh, four categories of uh, uh, symptoms, uh, of, sorry, four categories of uh, transmission depending on symptoms and other features that we identified as critical. The first one is symptomatic transmission. That simply means that the transmission occurs from a person that already is already showing symptoms, so fever or cough. So the person is at least aware that there is uh, a uh, that, 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 that is, uh, he could have some, uh, some respiratory disease uh, and the persons around him could be, could be also aware of that. The second category is pre-symptomatic, and this is an important one. The difference between the pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic is not often made uh, in the literature and in, in the media, but they are completely different. So pre-symptomatic refers to individuals that transmit uh, when they do not show symptoms, but they will show symptoms some, some later, at some point eventually. So you can test them. They, the test will reveal that they have the virus, but they are not showing symptoms. But uh, it, within a week, uh, they will show symptoms. Some cases are fully asymptomatic or pouchy symptomatic. That means that essentially do not show any symptom at all. Uh, or they show very, very mild symptoms that uh, cannot be really be detected. And this is a completely different class of transmissions. This, 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 uh, these individuals can transmit uh, probably for the same length of time as uh, symptomatic individuals, but of course they follow a different route from the point of view of the epidemiology. The fourth route is the environmental one. That means that, for example, droplets uh, uh, get on some surfaces formites, as they are called in epidemiology, stay there. Some other individual touches those surfaces and gets the virus. So this is a kind of very indirect transmission that you cannot easily trace. If someone, some of these droplets, for example, uh, uh, fell uh, over the handle of the door and you are touching this door and then later touching your face and transmitting the virus like that, it's very difficult to trace the transmission from the individual who was originally infected to you. So these four 
categories are not based on the biology of the virus, but rather on the epidemiology that we think is important. The reason why we chose these categories was that uh, there were some initial reports by Lee et al. in the first paper, the first uh, uh, reasonable paper on the Chinese epidemic on uh, early February, that uh, uh, most individuals that were infected initially in Wuhan had no memory of either having been to a, to a wet market or having been exposed to an individual with respiratory symptoms. So a large part of individuals basically had no recollection of how they could have got infected. This points towards pre-symptomatic transmission, asymptomatic transmission, and the environmental one, of course. And even the market is a case probably on, on, of environmental transmission. So our initial guess was that asymptomatic transmission and environmental transmission were key. We, we, we went through the literature, we tried to understand and to model a little bit, and we were disappointed. Asym the number of asymptomatics could be really high. There are some estimates around 40% even of the, of the cases, but it's a mixed bag of results uh, the, uh, with respect to their infectiousness. They seem to have high viral loads uh, as the others, but uh, not so high infectiousness. So they could contribute to the total number of cases, but they don't contribute so much to the forward transmissions of the virus. This is what you want to stop. This, that, that's the current understanding with a lot of uncertainties. Environmental uh, contribution doesn't seem to be great. It was a very important driver of the original 2003 SARS epidemic, but it doesn't seem to be a relevant driver in this epidemic, maybe accounting for 10-20% of cases. The only possible exception is the one wet market, who is the initial super spreading event. But in general, in the population, uh, oops, the, the, uh, the amount of environmental transmission does not seem to be the key for the rapid spreading of the virus. Okay, so we, sorry, we, we are left with symptomatic and presymptomatic transmission. Now, there is an important point about this too. The relation between presymptomatic and symptomatic transmission is essentially decided by the relation between the incubation period, that is how long it takes to develop the symptoms once you are infected, and the generation time, also sometimes called serial interval, that is how long it takes before you start transmitting effectively the disease. The virus needs to replicate in your throat and then uh, uh, your infections, your, your infections as grows uh, with time, and after some time uh, you have a peak in the uh, infectiousness of the individual. And the difference between these two peaks, uh, where where is the typical incubation period and where is the typical generation time, decides if tra if a transmission is symptomatic or presymptomatic. If the generation time is tends to be longer than the incubation period, it will be symptomatic. If it tends to be shorter, it will be presymptomatic. And there are, of course, examples of many diseases with, the, with either one or the other feature. So there's not a fixed relation between these, these two periods. And the, so the main question is how does it look like for this epidemic? So in the absence of reliable data, I went through hundreds of mostly newspaper articles and a few, a few scientific literature, but uh, given the urgency of the epidemic, one has literally to go to newspapers articles that detail some of the cases in many different countries and find out uh, information about uh, when some people showed symptoms, who infected them, when the person who infected them shows, showed symptoms, when they were probably exposed to another case and so on. And then do a simple maximum composite likelihood estimate uh, based on some uh, known estimate of the incubation period. Now, in these plots, uh, you see, so, here in, the, in this plot, you see the incubation period in red. So this is the distribution of the incubation period as found by Lauer at the beginning of the epidemic. So it's about five days. So it takes about five days to develop symptoms. Uh, our inference of the generation time from, again, many, not many, 40 cases well curated uh, with, with the mostly known time of exposure and time of onset of symptoms suggests 
that the, the best estimate according to the CAC information criterion is the blue line. And the, the, the maximum likelihood uncertainty, uh, well, the, like, the likelihood profiling, sorry, is uh, shown in gray. So there is a lot of uncertainty on this specific curve, but one picture is clear if you look at it. That there is the initial part of the curve of the generation time that grows uh, uh, faster than the incubation one. This means that at least in this regime, there is definitely presymptomatic transmission. And this uh, is an important point to quantify because uh, in, lit in the literature there's been a mixed bag of results. So here in black, you can see three different curves from our data, way, bull, gamma, and log normal. So three different fits and all, all of them show this feature of uh, the, the transmission starting before the onset of symptom. But in the literature, there were data from, uh, for example, early studies in China that were a bit biased towards SARS. The original SARS had like eight days or uh, longer as, uh, as uh, generation time. So you see that initial studies were a bit uh, weighting the data too much in the direction of the original SARS epidemic. And then uh, later studies uh, here had, uh, had been not so careful in how, into, how to include cases so obtaining very short uh, generation times. How is essentially there in the middle? The important thing is that uh, it shows still this behavior quite consistently between the functional forms and, uh, and profiling, that there is quite some function of uh, presymptomatic transmissions. We, we can quantify essentially via Bayesian approach knowing the, the, the curves beyond for all cases and looking at the data for each case. For the posterior probability that transmission occurred for each case that we're analyzing before symptoms. This is the distribution of the posterior of the posterior probabilities, and you see that there is a significant fraction that, that is suggested to be presymptomatic. Uh, this is, uh, if you want to see the average, this is the distribution of the average. So it's around 37 percent, but let's say that given the given uncertainty, 30, 45 percent of all transmission from cases that will become eventually symptomatic occur before the onset of symptoms. This is a number that has been uh, more or less confirmed uh, within this range in, uh, in a number of studies. So we, we pretty much believe right now that a good fraction of the transmission, almost 50% of them are presymptomatic. This is the key reason why this virus is difficult to stop because essentially you can transmit the virus before you have symptoms. Now, how you reach epidemic control? Uh, I will go through some very basic epidemiology. Apologies for those who know it very well. Uh, there are two key reproduction numbers in epidemiology. R0 and uh, let's call it R effective. R0 is the average number of infections that, that you cause if you put uh, an infected individual in a completely naive population. Uh, if this number is uh, less than one, the epidemic cannot spread. If the number is more than one and you start having a few cases, the epidemic is uh, will spread almost for sure. This is from basic theory of branching processes, if you want. Now, if you adopt uh, any kind of intervention, lockdown, social distancing, contact tracing, the number of infections caused by an infected individual will, uh, will, uh, will drop uh, to some number are effective. And if you want to control the epidemic, you have to reduce this, uh, this uh, production number to less than one. Now, uh, production numbers for this, this disease are not so easy to get. And you, there is quite a lot of variability in estimates in, uh, among different papers. The reason is that the proper way, well, the proper, the most appropriate way to estimate it uh, during a fast growing epidemic at the beginning is uh, using the so-called euler lotka equation that uh, many of you probably know. So the idea is that uh, you have the basic renewal equation, the, the incidence, that is the number of new cases at time t, is related to the number of new cases at the time uh, tau in the past, uh, times uh, the infectiousness uh, of uh, these new cases uh, after time tau post-infection. Uh, if you plug an exponential unsath with growth rate r into this equation, so you assume essentially that the number of cases will eventually go exponentially. That is a reasonable assumption uh, in uh, basically all models in the initial phase of the epidemic. Uh, you get the classic Euler-Lotka equation here. 
that connects the R0, so the average number of cases that are generated by a single infectious, infected individual, the growth rate of, of the whole epidemic, and the generation time distribution. That is the one that I just showed you. So uncertainties in the growth rate and the generation time distribution cause a lot of uncertainty in R0, that is the critical parameter for epidemic intervention. So this means that essentially we have estimates for not that go from two to five, six, but reasonably the best estimates that we have are around two, 2.5 for China and probably three, 3.5 for Europe. Now, when you pick the infectiousness, that is the number of cases, of new cases caused by an infected individual after a time tau post-infection, you can try to decompose that uh, into the different uh, um, transmission pathways that I outlined before. So you can model essentially transmission via symptomatic, uh, via the, it, the infectiousness of the individuals, time summary scaling because they are symptomatic and they could have lower infectiousness, time the fraction of symptomatic, and so on and so forth. And the same for presymptomatic, you can control for the amount of individuals that have symptoms before time tau and so on for symptomatic. And you can also have a delayed environmental transmission. And you can try to put together these four pieces to the best of our knowledge, uh, let's say now uh, also almost a month ago, although the picture has not changed significantly, and try to see what is the different contribution of these four components to the, to the, to the epidemic and two are not special, oops, sorry. And this is the contribution. So this is the decomposition of the infectiousness and of an R0 into the four components that I outlined. You see that uh, essentially environmental is, and asymptomatic does not seem to play a major role, although it contributes to the epidemic. And the big contributions come from presymptomatic and symptomatic transmission. And if you estimate it this way, you get the same result that about half of all transmissions are presymptomatic. Interestingly, if you look, uh, the pure contribution to R from presymptomatic transmissions is 0 0.9. So it's almost one. So basically there is no chance that you could stop the epidemic without tackling presymptomatic transmissions because by themselves, they are able to self-sustain the epidemic almost by themselves. May, may I ask a question? Sure. Yeah. Um, so how valuable are your parameters to that lead to this curve? How? Sorry. How valuable are your parameters that lead to this curve? So uh, the contribution of presymptomatic and symptomatic, they have this kind of uncertainty. So the, the fraction of presymptomatic transmissions versus all presymptomatic and symptomatic ones uh, in different studies uh, goes from uh, 30 to 45 percent. Our estimate is 37 percent, so it's right in the middle. Last studies tend to indicate uh, 45 percent, but again, uh, it's, it, things are still oscillating and not reaching our consensus because it's difficult to get a reliable data in the middle of an epidemic. These studies are from particularly for, for COVID in their particular? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Okay, okay. This is all, called for, all for COVID-19. Okay, okay. So, um, SARS-1, so the, the SARS that, uh, that, that occurred in 2003, and that is the closest virus to COVID-19, had a far long, it was far more uh, severe in terms of uh, clinical symptoms. That is why it was easier to stop in some sense. Having severe symptoms, also implies that it's easier to stop if you stop uh, symptomatic individuals as soon as possible. If you have a, a spectrum of mild diseases that can spread more easily, that is actually an, an obstacle. And that was realized by Fraser, Riley and collaborators in 2004, shortly after this, the original SARS, that it was lucky that SARS was so symptomatic, also in terms of its, trans of its transmission. And this means that essentially generation times for SARS were definitely longer. And uh, so SARS was initially a reference for these studies, but it's not a good one because really its epidemiological features are crucially different. Just that the disease moved from uh, prevalently 
lung disease in SARS to a mixture of uh, lung and upper respiratory tract. And of course, as the disease goes up the upper respiratory tract in terms of infection, it becomes less severe in clinical manifestations, but more contagious. So there is this trade-off. And unfortunately, COVID-19 falls in a kind, not, I would not say in a sweet spot because I have not proved that there is a sweet spot. But let's say that it's a diff, definitely a, a bad balance between uh, severe, severity of symptoms and uh, infectiousness. But it has nothing to do with SARS and SARS is not a reliable basis. For example, environmental transmission, that is an unknown parameter, was an important, uh, an important um, way for SARS to spread. In Hong Kong, essentially, there have been studies that estimate that almost all transmission essentially can be represented as environmental ones. And there are several well-known cases, hospitals, uh, big uh, residential buildings, and so on. Here, up beyond the one market, we have found little evidence that this is the case. So we start, honestly, we started with the belief uh, environmental and symptomatic would be the important parts, and we ended up with uh, no evidence for that. So that's where we are right now. Now, there is still the possibility that even if environmental is maybe not key, uh, sorry, environmental indirect transmission. Environmental transmission in the sense that, for example, people are having dinner together and some droplets end up in the other, uh, in, in the dish of the other person and the other person gets them. This kind of transmission can be important. And there are studies from the London School of uh, Tropical Health and Medicine uh, in London that show that uh, uh, family gatherings, mostly based on common meals, are a great way for the virus to spread. And many small super spreading events in China and elsewhere are based on these family gatherings. But uh, in, direct, uh, in direct environmental transmission, it says that the virus gets in the environment and three days later, someone touches uh, the same surface. It's not clear if that plays a role, but it doesn't appear to be big. The role of the symptomatics uh, is much more uncertain. There are studies, uh, the most reliable ones that, that are there out there now that say that they are probably so the most reliable study that is, uh, that is uh, on their number is not out yet. Uh, I've seen it confidential and it says 40, 45%. But the most reliable study on their, um, uh, on their infectiousness says that they are about 10% uh, of the normal infectiousness of, uh, of symptomatic people. So you get, you get a, a large fraction of them, but uh, relatively low infectiousness. So overall, they matter in the population, but they do not matter. But there is still a lot of uncertainty, especially on asymptomatic. So if I, if, would have, if I would have to flag some uncertainty, I would flag on the fact that asymptomatics could play a bigger role if the infectiousness would be higher. So the key point is that for what we know now, pre-symptomatic transmission is the main issue. Now, how to stop it? That's, uh, that's a critical point because uh, uh, of course uh, uh, you cannot easily flag pre-symptomatic uh, uh, people. The, 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 the normal way to do would be to find a symptomatic case and to trace its contacts. Some of them will be pre-symptomatic. If, if you are able to trace, it, to, to trace the contacts so, uh, fast enough, you can stop them from transmitting further. So contact tracing is one of the key ways that you can use together with testing, of course. Now, uh, the equations for contact tracing uh, uh, in, the, in the context of uh, essentially the same kind of epidemiological framework that I uh, discussed before are essentially the kerman mechanic equations for chains of infection. So these describe the number of cases at time t who were infected at time tau in the past by individuals who were infected in, term by, in a time tau prime in the past. So they describe the uh, density of a chain of infections with the different times. Uh, so these are the key equations to understand how contact tracing uh, works. Uh, and the equation, there is essentially one equation that expresses the fact that if you shift all the times, the, the, uh, it basically expresses mathematically the fact that if you have an individual that is uh, um, right now infected, 
uh, it is assumed to be infected for a little bit. So the number, the cumulative number of individuals infected, uh, if you pick the individuals that are infected now, will not change. Uh, and the second one is a sort of next generation equation that is essentially uh, what happens uh, moving from one generation of, uh, of, um, of, of infections to the next one and including in this uh, the, the fraction of infection that is stopped by isolation of the, of the initial case and contact tracing in quarantine. And uh, so for example, here you see that essentially the number of new infections is determined by uh, the infectiousness after a time tau and the fact that, that the person is symptomatic and uh, therefore if it is isolated with a given efficiency, the fraction of symptomatic people will essentially be removed from the infection system. The contribution from contact tracing and quarantine is much more complicated and I won't discuss it here, but it, it basically reconstructs what is the impact uh, on the next generation of, the, of the doing contact tracing and quarantine on this one. Now, the, the matter is that you can solve these equations with uh, exponential and SAF, uh, obtaining some sort of generalized version of the euler lotka equation. So if you solve these equations, you get uh, essentially uh, an operator of this form. And the euler lotka equation, instead of being an implicit equation, an implicit integral equation, becomes the eigenvalue equation of this operator with the, with the, with the eigenvalue one. So the, essentially assuming this operator as an eigenvalue, as a maximum eigenvalue one actually, and uh, solving the eigenvalue equation, you obtain the growth rate in the presence of contact tracing and isolation of symptomatic cases. That is what you want to understand how you can control the epidemic in terms of the efficiency of isolation and the efficiency of contact tracing. Um, you can also twist this equation by putting r equal zero to actually infer instead what is the maximum r naught that would be controlled by the system. So uh, bas because basically beta is the generation time that we know times r naught. So if you neglect this term, you have r naught in uh, equal to one. Sorry, sorry. You have r naught that is related to the inverse. Um, eigenvalue of the system in some way. And when that eigenvalue is one, you are essentially asking what are the conditions such that R naught is brought down to one. Now let's use this, this second uh, interpretation and let me show you the results. So the parameters, just to remind you, the success in isolating cases so when you have a asymptomatic case, how often can you isolate it at home? And if you have its contacts, how often do you succeed in convincing them to quarantine? And also, of course, to convince them, you have to trace the original case, to trace the contacts and to convince them to quarantine. So these are the plots for different delays between symptoms and the time that you do contact tracing. You can see this first plot that if the delay, if there is no delay, Actually, with the parameters for this disease, you have a fair chance of controlling the disease if you are effective enough. So it says that you can reach up to four, uh, are not to equal four, so four transmission for each person that are controllable just by contact tracing alone. And realistically, with the finite uh, effective, uh, finite effectiveness of contact tracing, you can reach 2.5, that is this line, or even three. And you can easily reach two. So you can easily bring down R not from two cases per individual infected to one case with, with contact tracing with not huge, with not huge uh, uh, effectiveness. But uh, things change dramatically if you wait some time. You see that as you, if you wait a few hours, things do not change that much, although they worsen. But if you start waiting days, this typical time it is needed to test the person, find its contacts and so on, you don't have any chance to control the epidemic. And if you wait three days, you don't have any chance to control the epidemic in any case, basically. 
This is the key reason why speed is essentially of the utmost importance. Speed and effectiveness. You need the, you, essentially you need to be in a regime where you are around here. So small delays between symptoms and the time that you quarantine contacts and high, effect, high let's say 60% at least uh, success in isolating both the case and the contacts. Now, this means that essentially you have to find a fast solution for this, for, to this. The reason, to give an intuition behind the plots, the reason why, it, and, and behind the, the mechanical equations, the reason why it matters is that uh, if you have a symptomatic case, you see it uh, when most of the transmissions are already gone, let's say 50% of them, a bit more possibly if you have a little bit of delay in, uh, in validating the case. If you wait, uh, three, four days, uh, all, the all the cases that were infected by this index case uh, here will also be beyond the point uh, where, they, uh, where they transmitted uh, most of the possible transmissions that they could. If you do it immediately, you can stop these cases in the early phases when they still haven't transmitted the virus further that much. So that is why it's key to be fast. Um, so, the key message of our work was that isolation and contact tracing can stop the epidemic. They are one of the classical tools of, of epidemiology and it could work, but requires high efficiency and short response times. And the uh, three days versus no delays is, is, is really striking. So this is the growth rate this time. So what I'm showing here is the growth rate of the virus if uh, you have this delay to isolation and contact quarantine, so three days or no delay at all. And uh, I'm assuming are not equal to two in this case. So the virus without intervention is, is, uh, is causing two new cases for each case, uh, for each infected case. And you can see that essentially the growth of the virus is still positive if you have uh, insufficient, uh, insufficient uh, efficiency. And it's basically always positive in, uh, in the setup where you wait three days. While there is quite a large region where the growth of the virus is, uh, is, is both below zero in the case of no delay. Now, this led us to make a suggestion in epidemiological terms that is uh, thinking about these digital solutions. The reason is that there are a few tools of classical epidemiology that can be used against COVID-19, but these tools are difficult to exploit. Physical distancing, isolation, and quarantine uh, is either insufficient if done, uh, let's say, at low levels, or it is a lockdown with high social and economic costs, as you know. You can use mass screening and testing and manual contact tracing, but the problem is that this tool is hard to scale up for a rapid response, both because you need lots of contact tracers to do it faster and you need a lab capacity to be able to deploy large number of tests around. So doing, uh, uh, doing it in the manual way is not impossible, but requires huge resources. And it's difficult to deploy in the middle of a growing epidemic. It could be a good option for, let's say, initial response in, in the presence of a few cases, but uh, most counters have been uh, taken by surprise right now and uh, we, have a growing, we, we have a large epidemic in, uh, in most European countries and in the, in the US. The real killing point would be vaccination, of course. The famous herd immunity is not so much the herd immunity of the virus going to the population. It's the herd immunity obtained through a vaccine. But uh, there are times for the, for the phase of the development and especially trial. I mean, development is essentially over for many projects. There are like 80 vaccine, vaccine projects in the world and several of them are already since some time and they have started the clinical trials. But you need the time for the clinical trials because you do not want, I mean, in a vaccine that you have to spread to maybe half of the population, you do not want collateral effects that are major ones. And you need time to, to make sure of that. You also need time to scale up production. And that, so Bill Gates has proposed essentially to build the factories before we know which vaccine will work and essentially throw uh, throw away all the factors that we do not need, we use only the ones that we need, just uh, because that is the kind of need for time that we have. And, and the need to have this uh, uh, infrastructure already. So essentially in the short term, the only technologies that can scale 
in a fast and scalable way for, the, for, for epidemic response at the digital ones. And this is why we proposed uh, something that has been uh, proposed in some form in the past and applied also by China, South Korea in different forms. And we proposed that an adapted version for contact tracing basically. That is uh, an app that uh, registers, uh, uh, rec record, uh, sorry, records all your contacts in, uh, uh, in your everyday life in an anonymous way. So essentially, your phone knows that it's, it, it's in proximity with another phone. They communicate and they record some messages from each other. So they know in an anonymous way their contacts. Then at some point, one of these individuals find out uh, he has fever or cough. Uh, for example, can request a test and, uh, and report the symptoms and is found to be positive. Then all the individuals that he was in, con in close contact, let's say a few meters, that is the typical distance for droplets, will receive an instant signal saying, please, you have been in close contact with, uh, with, with, with an individual that, is, that was infected, you are at high risk, please self-isolate for 14 days or whatever is the public health policy that is uh, deemed uh, reasonable. Some individuals can get a signal for, uh, let's say, you are at risk, but not at great risk. Please just uh, use enhanced social and physical distances measures. You, you, you do not necessarily have to stay at home, uh, but you have to know that you could be infectious. So this is the simple schema for the app. The app just do that, essentially, in its uh, simplest uh, idea, just communicate to all the contacts that they have to celebrate in an instant way. And therefore, essentially do the, work, do the work that contact tracers would do manually in, uh, in, in one, two, three days. Now, one important point that this app brings down are not. As I've shown you, essentially what this app does is essentially bringing down uh, the number of infections uh, from each infected individual in practice. So this is useful with different, uh, maybe with different parameters and with different, um, with different implementations during all the, the whole epidemic. It's useful initially because essentially if the app uh, forces the effective R to go below one, it's, usual, it's, it's useful initially because it can prevent the initial spread the same way a vaccine would do. Essentially you have a sort of technological herd immunity. I do not like the term and there's been a lot of uh, uh, negative connotations with that immunity due to the due to Boris Johnson and uh, his, uh, his maverick strategy initially. But right now, the point is that this is a sort of technological herd immunity. You do not stop uh, the, uh, the, the, the virus from infecting someone, but you stop it from spreading. So it works, it, it essentially works in the same way as a vaccine in reducing the overall R of the, of the, of the, of the virus although it doesn't protect the individual itself. Uh, so it's useful in all, in all contexts. It can prevent initial spread. So if you have a population that is uh, naive, but you have a few imported cases, those cases cannot grow too much or cannot grow too fast. If uh, you are in a situation where you are, you are in, a, in a lockdown and you want to get, uh, uh, to, to get, uh, to get the, the situation under control, you can apply some sort of smart lockdown or adapted, lo adapted lockdown. It is, using the app in a very conservative way, alerting all contacts, no matter how small, and keeping a large fraction of the population at home, but not all the whole population or a random fraction, but this, the fraction that is deemed most at risk. Uh, you can use it for a smart exit from the lockdown to prevent a second peak, because you have the flexibility, for example, to, as soon as you see the second peak, you can have the app in place. The app can, uh, work as a basic control of the virus, but can, can be essentially changed in a moment to work uh, as a smart lockdown to prevent the second peak. And this is quite an important function right now. And of course, it's useful also late in the epidemic to control the residual spread and to control the new imported cases. Hopefully, when there will be an, uh, an, uh, uh, a slowdown of the epidemic and there will be maybe few cases of local transmission and many imported ones. There are challenges. 
first, this, uh, the, the first challenge that is an important one is that this uh, big experiment has not been tried in, 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 uh, in history, but also this is a, an epidemic like uh, no one has, has seen in, in history, uh, in the last century at least. So uh, it's, uh, I mean, in this sense, uh, the extreme experiment is justified by the extreme uh, epidemic. Of course, there are technical limitations in smart, smartphone coverage and in the contact and technologies. Right now, the only one that has been, been deemed viable for this approach is Bluetooth low energy. It's essentially a low energy form of signaling uh, your presence via, via Bluetooth. But multiple approaches could be needed. Uh, uptake should be really high. You have seen the plot. Uh, it requires 50, 60% of the population using the app. Our latest simulations require that eight in, 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 in the UK, 80% of the active population uses the app. There are different measures for children and elderly, but for the active population between, uh, let's say, 15 and, uh, and, and, uh, and 60, about 80% uh, of the population should use the app to curb the epidemic completely. Of course, if 60% uh, of the population uses the app, or 50%, that means that the app works, but just slows down the epidemic instead of curbing it, uh, and so on. It's key to have compliance with the app recommendation to stay at home, of course, because the app does not enforce that recommendation. The app just communicates the person that the person is at risk of infecting others and he should uh, or she should self-isolate. Doesn't, doesn't, doesn't do anything else and requires the collaboration of the individual, of course. It requires some scale up of diagnostic testing across Europe because of course it's much more reliable if you have a testing associated with each index case. And since the European epidemic, as I've shown you before, is growing a bit faster than the Chinese one, it's possible that some degree of physical distance could still be required in addition to the app to bring it down. And of course the app is, it's in, it's, it's, uh, the, the, the whole idea of the app and the implementation is it, it, in its infancy, so there are, iterative improvements to the backend and front-end that are needed, and a lot of uh, scientific improvements to understand how does this work, what are the best algorithms, what is the interplay with the other interventions, and so on. What, what, what is the interplay with the social context and geographical, one, and geographical mobility, and so on. So th there is lots that needs to be understood, and unfortunately, unfortunately in a short time. There are big ethical issues. Uh, about this. I mean, the app is, uh, of course, uh, not especially invasive by itself, but the data that it collects are quite uh, um, delicate, being uh, direct contact data. So the, the, the choice of basically all European governments who already started thinking about it is to deploy it with individual consent. So individuals will have to choose if to download it and install it and use it. This means that, that uh, any, this is a, a legitimate choice. It means it also means that one has to build trust and confidence at every stage. And especially the app should be in, essentially in the hands of uh, respected health authorities. So for example, in France, it could be in Serm or Pasteur. In, uh, in, uh, in England, uh, uh, is NHSX the essentially digital arm of NHS, of the National Health Service, that is, uh, that is preparing it. The National Health Service in, in England is a highly respected institution that commands a lot of public trust. Uh, then, of course, the, the, the algorithms behind the app should be transparent and auditable. And, of course, there are lots of consideration on data security and, uh, uh, and, and security of the communication that I cannot even uh, start because they are probably well beyond my understanding as well. Uh, there is a need to carefully consider who can use this app, who cannot. So there are, spe there are many specific groups that require strategies that are uh, tailored to them. Healthcare workers, workers in contact with the public continuously, elderly people, children, and so on and so forth. Sorry. Uh, to understand how could be the potential take, if there is there any chance that this would work, uh, we started investigating the situation in uh, in the UK, 
this was uh, around the time of lockdown. So I think, I think even this, this, this poll was done before the time of lockdown in the UK. So you see that the question is, would you install the app? And almost 80% of people uh, would you, uh, at the question, would you install the app, uh, answered definitely or probably. And uh, this increases if there if they are infections in the community or if they know, of course, someone that is infected. And increases even more in lockdown, unsurprisingly, because I, I know, I personally know many times who would pay to have this app and get out of lockdown, literally. Um, sorry, uh, including this little girl, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, there is also the point that uh, need compliance with the recommendation to self-isolate and again data is really positive once people have the app they would tend to comply definitely uh, also because it's a, it's a it's a way to it's a way to respect uh, it's a way to respect uh, the, the the others and to and to essentially avoid the infections to people that they are around them so there is a, there is both an uh, uh, altruistic and utilitarian reason to uh, to uh, comply with the suggestion to quarantine uh, of course uh, this is also the main reason for installing the app protect family and friends responsibility for the community and so on and unsurprisingly, the concerns are essentially, well, no, the concerns are, are surprising. There is a, at least in the UK, there is a fraction of population that is of course concerned about the government surveillance and a fraction that just feels very anxious. So this is a significant issue, for example, for the app. People that would not install it because they just would feel very scared about the possibility of knowing that they have disease or that they are at risk. Just a few comments on the recent developments because there have been uh, there have been quite some uh, quite some developments in the in the last weeks. So, so there, are, there there have been many many projects uh, that started even before we proposed the idea. So some of the U.S. projects, uh, like citizen science projects, uh, were started before we came out with the with the epidemiological proof that this would work. Uh, they are now mostly concentrated in two main consortia. One is the PPPPT, uh, Pan European Privacy Preserving Proximity Tracing for Europe. It is a consortium that essentially uh, has developers from Germany, France, uh, Switzerland, and Italy, and uh, has, some, has close contact with, uh, with the NHS in England. And then there is a, there is a coalition in North America. Uh, say loose coalition, let's say, because of course the the idea is being uh, discussed by European governments. While in in the US, as far as I know, it's been only promoted by communities and uh, universities. Uh, the common choice of technology is this Bluetooth or low energy. That is, uh, and pretty much essentially all developers are talking to, uh, to to one another. So there is a worldwide community of developers working on this uh, given the urgency of, uh, of this thing uh, and this is good uh, because of course one key thing is interoperability so you want to be to be able to own um, across countries in europe for example because you want to bring back schengen and normal mobility across uh, across european countries but this is good also for moving into other countries like the us uh, there have been much development at the European level, and there are, I will not comment on individual countries right now unless you have particular questions. Let's say that there are different countries at different stages. Some, some, of the, some, some countries have not even uh, started thinking about the idea. Several of them uh, have started thinking and are in the process of taking decisions. Some of them has, have already started, essentially. Iceland, uh, um, Norway, and I think Austria in some form, uh, and so on. Uh, so, and let's say there is a lot of uh, of discussion of and to harmonize this at the European level. And it's uh, unfortunately the the times to coordinate are longer than the times that are required for this app to work. So this is the key of the of the issue right now. 
uh, there have been a recent uh, announcement by Google and Apple putting together the forces to build it within the uh, within the operating systems. So essentially, in the next release of uh, iOS and Android, uh, there will be the app tracing integrating into the operating system. This has a big epidemiological pause, but as you can expect, uh, political cons, uh, and is still very much in active discussion because of course uh, it's uh, as controversial as having this information in the hands of the governments or even more. And, uh, and so it's the situation about this last point and how things will evolve is completely uh, chaotic. And uh, my understanding is uh, that uh, essentially in Europe, there will be an attempt to avoid the involvement of Google and Apple in this form, but cannot predict the future. Uh, now, just to summarize, what uh, is uh, that is there and what is that can be done? So the important message is that app-based contact tracing could potentially control the epidemic and should be at the core of epidemic response. But our work was just a proof of principle. So there is a lot to understand about how to use it, what, what, how it works in realistic contact networks, how to optimize the contact tracing uh, in itself, the second point is that it's, 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 it would be very, very risky to bet our cards on this solution alone, because this is an experiment. The safe strategy is to integrate this tool within all the other tools of, uh, uh, of epidemiological interventions that are available. So epidemiological surveillance, risk forecast for, uh, for, for different regions and for different countries, geolocation of hotspots and massive testing and manual contact tracing there. Local lockdowns eventually if needed. It's still unclear how this will play in form the other interventions. So of course this intervention should be all synchronized and how the interplay will, will be, that, that's at present quite unclear. Widespread diagnostic testing is still critical because you need to diagnose the virus, you need to know where it is, if you want to use the app, it's better if you are able to diagnose the index cases, maybe not immediately when you send the message, but at least uh, shortly after so that you can eventually release people from quarantine if you have quarantined them incorrectly, for example. Physical distancing is still important. I do not want to raise false illusions that uh, we will get out of this uh, soon uh, with uh, the same kind of life that we had uh, uh, in the past, uh, unfortunately for many people, including me. Uh, there will be some restriction to physical to, to physical contacts for quite some time because the epidemic was just too strong. So I do not think that anybody could think about uh, saying, okay, from tomorrow we install the app, life goes on as usual. The, the, the idea is that life could go in a more normal way, but I, I would not ensure that you can have, for example, densely packed restaurants that, that adapt. I do not know what will be the rules for concept and, and, and big events. I do not know what, it, what will be the future of, for example, open spaces or workers that are more very much exposed to the public and so on and so forth. And a key thing right now is that there are many gov European governments that are close to the point of having to decide what to do and they need support and advice. And if you have the possibility to do any of these, uh, I urge you to do what you can in this respect because the times are short uh, and essentially from the scientific side, uh, we are quite short-ended because this, is a, this kind of work and this kind of experiment has been uh, uh, developed in such a short time compared to what are the typical times of, uh, of any kind of epidemic response that even we don't have even clear modeling at this point uh, we don't have agreement between modelers. We don't, lots of things are needed to understand better how these things work. And of course, lots of support for the, for the government to be able to uh, take effective decisions in this direction. Okay, thank you. Uh, so you can find a bit more about our research uh, here. And I would like to thank uh, all the group. Probably some of you know Christoph Fraser, who is the person behind uh, essentially this, uh, this, this project. And also David Davis is the clinician who essentially proposed the app together with Christopher. 
and the high-end case took most of the epidemiological work behind that. Uh, and so thank you very much and I'm uh, very open to take questions if you have some. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, so uh, to, to, to ask questions, please raise your hand. Uh, okay, so Dirk. Uh, yeah, first of all, thank you very much. It was a fantastic talk, actually. <laughs> we, we started to do some simulation, maybe I, I would, I hope you would not mind if I would contact you for, because you're much more expert than we are. Um, sure, if, if, if I, so my, my mail is, uh, well, um, it, you don't have my mail, but I can write it in chat. Uh, why is that? Chat? I, I, I can send it to everybody. Okay, okay, okay. Really so, thank you. So anyone who wants to get in touch, uh, we have working groups already, already that, that, that should discuss some things. The situation is very chaotic and I, I apologize because I am in different working groups for different governments or different purposes, but I am very happy to involve you in any possible way right now. So if you, if you, want, if you want to help or, or to put you in touch with someone else who could. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So just one, so the question that I wanted to ask is, um, I mean, um, when I protect myself with, um, with gloves and with, uh, with a mask, what is the chance even if I carry the virus that I pass it to somebody else. Can one estimate this one? So the truth is the mask seems to be very effective uh, in, uh, okay. The mask is a complicated piece of, uh, piece of work. The mask has two purposes, to stop infections. There is little evidence about that, uh, but uh, the previous work on SARS-1 in Hong Kong suggests that the mask reduces by 60%, although the sample, the sample was small, but it's a reduction of about 60%, if I remember correctly, the odds of taking the virus. So this, is, this was a retrospective study done in Hong Kong in 2004. It's pretty the, much the only evidence that is there, but it's a very interesting and striking one because the, the effect is quite large, even if the sample was relatively small. So the suggestion is that a mask and it was not specified what kind of mask could have some protective effect. The major effect is in our protecting others because essentially droplets get, get, get stopped by the mask. Now, the idea is that to do this, I think, again, the kind of mask does not matter too much. So if you have a full R and you put it in front of your, of your mouth when you speak, that is probably as effective to 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 to, to um, sorry reduce the amount of droplets that you that you that you, that you spread uh, as any other tool. So even very simple precautions like essentially covering uh, uh, one's mouth with fullers or so on uh, could be very effective. Uh, sorry. No, the problem is that studies, uh, so definite studies uh, are a bit lacking, but this seems to be the common opinion. I, I, I saw one but, but, um, but where, they, where they measured and uh, they, they, they exactly said what you say. I mean, you take uh, anything that protects the most probably and then uh, for infected people, they, um, you, you, don't, you could not measure anything in the, in the, in the bracing air. One thing that struck is that just uh, my second and last question, because there are also others, is, is um, I, I was surprised how, um, how similar in the different regions of uh, of Italy, the um, the curves uh, develop. So this um, we were we, we started to to code something on in space and um, um, to understand uh, what happens if you have interaction between the region by by using the plane, the train, whatever. Uh -huh. But now I'm wondering whether this is really so important because uh, the curves are so similar that one could um, that one could get the impression that the well mixed uh, assumption that you're using is very is so good that maybe space doesn't matter that much. What do you think about that? So one of the similarity of the curves uh, is of course what happened after lockdown, because at that point, uh, essentially everyone is in lockdown with the same condition. So the lockdown was essentially enforced uh, Italy wide. So when you see the slowdown of the curves that could look the same because precisely, essentially more or less all of Italy is in the same situation of lockdown. Down. Conditions, it's unclear because uh, so, so these curves seem all to start very fast, 
but there are, there could be different reasons behind the start starting so fast. One could be ascertainment. So in places like uh, Lombardia or Emilia Romagna, the virus was already there, and they did so. So they didn't count enough hospitalized cases at the beginning. There were people who were already in the hospital because of the disease, but they, but the they, the authorities didn't know. Uh, so the initial part could be an effect of this ascertainment bias. In, while in other parts, the, the faster incre initial increase is due, to, is due to mobility. So especially the virus was in Northern Italy and there was a spread towards Southern Italy due to a series of introduced cases. And of course, uh, you, have a faster, uh, you have a faster rate because you have the exponential rate of each case uh, convoluted by the rate of uh, uh, mobility. Of, uh, of infected cases from north to south. So it could be that the similarity be, be behind those curves is only apparent and actually there are different re reasons for the kind of profile of, the, of those curves. My feeling is that uh, the kind of rates of growth are very similar all across Europe. I haven't seen uh, very much difference in, in growth. I, I haven't put a plot, but if you if you look at the growth rate across Europe, the difference is not so striking. Mm -hmm. Maybe Spain is a bit worse than the others, of course, because Spain has a very high rate of physical contact. So if I would have guessed who was the f worst one in Europe, I would have guessed Spain, and I would get I, I guessed right. But it's not a huge effect, for example. And uh, and countries that uh, manage to to keep the, the number of cases low still show a rate that was comparable. So I, the rate of, the rate of uh, in case in Germany was not especially different from other countries. The number of cases and the number of severe cases it was, they, they were having much more surveillance probably and they were lacking the initial distribution of cases maybe, but essentially the rate of growth uh, was very similar. So my feeling is that there, there are some kind of uh, common drivers of this epidemic. That does not mean that uh, in the next uh, step but mobility across geographic regions is not important. I think when there will be a few scattered cases, mo uh, mobility is a, is, a, is a key to assess risk and so on. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, there there is a question by David. There was a question in the chat, but yeah. I... Uh, ah, oh, sorry. yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, so Just because yeah. otherwise I will forget. How do we assess infections of asymptomatic cases? Uh, the work that was done uh, was the following. They found first infected cases. So it was, a, let's say, classical epidemiologists. They found infected cases in China, like some hundreds of cases, if I remember correctly. And they isolated as many of their contacts they could. And then they followed the clinical, uh, the clinical uh, uh, course of their contacts. And they looked at how many of the contacts were testing positive and how many of the contacts were showing symptoms and so on. Some of the cases, including the original in the original set were symptomatic and uh, it was seen that of their contacts, the fraction that was developing symptoms or, result, uh, or being positive to a test was much, much lower than uh, in for mild cases and for severe cases. Uh, there was about a factor of 10, if I remember correctly, between, uh, between uh, these, these um, Asymptomatic cases and the mild ones, and a further factor of ten, no, sorry, of a further factor of two between mild and severe cases. So severe cases were about twice as infectious. Again, counting from the attack rate on the contacts. Uh, there are caveats there that is uh, essentially that uh, asymptomatic could also mean something a bit ambiguous because very mild cases and symptomatic one are some way difficult to disentangle clinically. So the so-called pouchy symptomatic cases, that is essentially when there is maybe as very light symptoms, but uh, so I am I'm not a clinician. I do not fully understand that the uh, clinical differences. There are some, but epidemiologically they are very difficult to, to study. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. David? Yeah, um, yeah, thank you uh, for this really interesting presentation. It's Davide Martinetti from uh, INRA in Avignon. So my question was about contact tracing, because I, I know from, from social science literature that contact tracing in humans uh, almost always, always shows up giving a quite uh, non-random structure in the population, meaning that there are individuals that 
works like hubs, meaning that they have a lot of contacts and people that are kind of in the periphery of, the, of this network of contact between peoples. So I was wondering if this model that you use, the kernak mckendrick equation, that I'm sorry, but I didn't know it before, takes into account the fact that, that the, the underlying population has a, a quite complex structure. It is not a random uh, contact structure. And what are also the possibilities for imagining uh, this content tracing app working in detecting those hubs, those persons, those people that are more likely to, to foster the spread among the population if then surveillance and intervention can go um, towards those people in, uh, in advance uh, when, when the, at, the very, at the very beginning of the epidemics, those people can be the, the real important people to not to stop, but to make sure that they are um, not infectious. And just, okay, thank you, if you can answer this. There are two points. So it's and up, it, it, it cannot be doubted that, uh, of course, uh, essentially the heterogeneities in the contacts matter and they are not captured uh, in, uh, in the way, in the appropriate way in the, <coughs> in the epidemiological equations. The, it's not clear how many of these individuals are there actually in the time of there are individuals that have lots of social connections how many physical contacts do they have in a given range of time it's probably more related to professions so what kind of what is your job then to the to the nature of, of hub or non hub so for example politicians have been hit quite badly as you know because essentially their job puts them in contact with lots of people. Same for uh, bus drivers, same for uh, workers that moreover get in touch with a lot of infected people. So there is a dependence probably more on the job than on the social network in itself. So that the viability of the social network is not so wide in terms of a short period of time. So in terms of the total number of, acquaintance, of acquaintances, these distributions are have quite a, a, a long tail. But the, the, the number of acquaintances that you, that you get in touch with physically within uh, three days uh, is not necessarily so uh, over dispersed. That said, uh, the point is uh, it's key to model that and it's key to take that into account. Uh, the issue there is that uh, uh, if you can save the network of the contacts, of course, you can even locate these people in advance and you can target the intervention. It's not clear that this is what most implementations of the app will do. The reason is that the implementations of the app that are being discussed now are really privacy preserving. So they try not to give out any information Possibly not to the not to the individuals, of course, but also not so much to the government. So the possibility of targeting these individuals, uh, of, of course, you can do it in simulations. We we have uh, simulations with a little bit of that, uh, and it it doesn't seem to play a big role. But I'm not sure that the, the over dispersion that we are capturing is the actual one, actually. Uh, because there are again jobs that are very special in that respect and one should focus not on what is the over dispersion among the population but what is the number of contacts in those jobs and that is a different question yeah actually i think uh, if you want and those jobs could be could need to be targeted separately with a, with a kind, kind of different analysis and be taken into account in the app but the point is also will this information be available to the, the public health authorities via the app or it will not be this is still an open question. So some, some places want to have uh, essentially the whole network of contact saved uh, at least for a short time uh, with uh, the servers uh, of the health authorities. So that essentially you can uh, study uh, the network of infected contacts at least. But uh, the, inform the, the general idea is that uh, this information will not uh, be uh, saved for most countries except for the, for infected cases. 
An important question is uh, if uh, it is important to save the information, for example, also for the contacts. So my, my personal position is that uh, there is a little bit of trade-off between privacy and uh, uh, epidemiological safety. In the sense that, for example, if I have an individual that, that, that test is positive, I want to send a message to the contacts, uh, but I would also like to retrieve uh, how many contacts is or are contacts had in the last three days. Because if I find some of, some of these individuals that, as you say, have a much wider social, uh, social network, uh, and so I have many more contacts. So these individuals represent a higher risk and I would like to test them, offer test them as soon as possible and be sure if they are positive or not. But these kind of questions also are intermixed with what is the algorithm and what are the data that the app will actually save. And this is unfortunately a point where the discussion has been heavily, and I say very heavily, uh, skewed towards privacy issues and not enough to, uh, towards epidemiological requirements. So now we are just trying to put it back towards the epidemiological requirements, but that until now has been shaped by, by essentially saying, by people who are saying the privacy is paramount. Uh, who cares how epidemiological effective this could be? I am of the, of the opinion that the privacy is important, but if there is some effective epidemiological information, there should be a way to retrieve it. So I agree that, for example, the, no, the, the number of contacts, at least the degree distribution, of the contacts of an individual that should be available in order to assess if there is a, a high risk of further spread, so an, a hub nearby or not. But again, this, this is just political and that is a different side. Yeah, actually in, in the UK, there has been a, a nice experiment uh, made by the, the BBC called Contagion, in which they, they implemented such kind of app and they recorded in meetings at the beginning in some villages and then all across the UK from volunteers that uh, installed the app and look at how, uh, in that case, was uh, an informatic contagion from one uh, mobile with, an app, with the installed app to another. And it was really nice uh, results on that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The problem there is uh, basically that uh, we do not know much of, of this virus uh, to be sure that we can simulate it correctly. Uh, there, there has been some discussion about it, uh, uh, but the, the, one of the problems is that uh, we could uh, have some along the way. For example, the expression of the actual, of the actual uh, infect infectiousness is not clear. So you can have individuals that may be high, highly infectious, uh, even if they don't have maybe special symptoms, but they are highly infectious by themselves. These individuals could act as super spiders. There has been some discussion about it, but no hard data. And this could matter a lot of, in, in practice uh, with respect to any simulation, because there is not a matter only on the contact, but also on, the, on what is the actual risk of any specific individual. So I, I am... I am a bit skeptical about uh, what we can learn, uh, not from the app, but from these kind of simulations. Uh, I was in discussing with also other people who have large contact networks. My feeling is that uh, it would be better to be able to learn from the app itself, essentially, because then, then we have the real contagion with the real epidemiological parameters. That maybe we don't know, but the virus know, knows them very well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I have an immediate and obvious question. So in order the contact tracing is working, uh, so it can be considered somehow as an infectious disease. And the infectiousness of the contact traces should track, uh, tracking should be bigger than the infectiousness of the COVID in order to be, uh, to be working. So meaning that uh, if you are close to somebody who may have uh, or may uh, four days later uh, be uh, infected, then you will be put in your uh, uh, self-isolation. The conclusion is that there will be a lockdown after uh, one or two weeks, no? Uh, no, not necessarily. Um... So you can do some study about this, I guess. You can consider that the, the contact tracing is a sort of uh, uh, infectious disease and see how it spreads. 
But the point, so the point here is that uh, the contact tracing, so the limitation of the contact tracing is, is, is testing, basically. So are you able to test all individuals who report symptoms or not? And how long it takes? So it's, uh, it's, so it's more complicated than, than, uh, than uh, an infectious process because essentially there are the delays due to the testing capacity. Those delays are the ones that actually govern the, so the availability of testing and the delays are the ones that govern the epidemic. So uh, in, in principle, you could also do a recursion, but that, that is a slightly different method and it's not clear yet uh, how it would work. Uh, but yeah, no, so the, you don't have necessary lockdown in the sense that if contact tracing is, is effective enough, uh, the, the, the growth of the virus does, does need to be positive. So you can have a, a local outbreak and then negative rates, and then the, you, you, you are just quarantining a few people and that's all. It's also possible that you don't control the virus and then essentially the contact tracing uh, tracks, uh, tracks the, whole, uh, the whole development of the virus until you have maybe a sizable fraction of the epidemic in, of the population in, lock, in lockdown. So, Assume that there is a second wave, we don't control it. The app or the other interventions cannot control it. You start quarantining more and more people until maybe 20% of the population is at home. Mm -hmm. that, is, uh, that is the smart lockdown scenario that I was outlining essentially, where what contact tracing does is essentially telling who should, be, who should stay at home priority, with priority and who should not. Mm. Okay. Uh, Sonia, have as one question, Sonia Forati. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing, uh, I'm seeing right now. Uh, the answer is no. So the, what I know is that the, the, the study from the London School was, uh, was on Chinese cases, because in China they found many cases uh, that were essentially associated with. Uh, with the high attack rates on family gatherings, but there's been little uh, study on that as far as I know in Europe. Uh, I, there, there, there could be something that I missed, uh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not really sure, but uh, as far as I know, there's been not much. Okay, last question maybe, Matthew? Yeah. Can I just, Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, can I? I don't just, know if you hear uh, me. Answer the question about uh, or add, add some comment to uh, Lucas uh, comment to Lucas response. Is, Mathieu, can you wait like uh, maybe thirty seconds? Sure. Amoy, please. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so no, just to mention that uh, we are in the process of of, gi of giving away questionnaires uh, on um, that 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 should be like uh, filled up by households. Uh, which will uh, inform about uh, the size of the families, the size of, a, of the household, and the dates of appearance of symptoms uh, inside, inside the household in order to uh, obviously like, uh, estimate the, the infection rate inside household, but also the, 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 the role of some factors like the size of the family with respect to the size also of the, of the apartment or the, of the house. And uh, of course, uh, other factors like risk factors, age, etc., and also uh, estimate the, the proportion of asymptomatics uh, and this kind of this kind of stuff. So the, the questionnaire should be available like from Monday, and uh, there would be uh, an advertisement on, on this list, and uh, I, I think from the CNRS. Okay, I, I think Italy is doing the same, uh, but they are being a bit slow in processing the data. But, mm. So I, I, I know that no, in North Italy there have been these studies, but I, I cannot, I mean, they are, I think they are overwhelmed. So they, 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 they had no time for this, for, to, to actually process effectively these studies. Okay. So I, I, hope, I, hope, I hope it will be faster than then. I mean, <laughs> it, it would be, be interesting to know how. how, how so we are, also in, we are also in relation with other countries, but not Italy. Uh, so if you have if you have contacts where that you can give me, a, a uh, I, I I could put you in touch if you want to exchange uh, something. I, I could put you I could put you in touch with the, the people who should have access to it. Right. Then uh, it, Italian Italian bureaucracy is what what you know it is. So, yeah. okay. 
not sure about that. <laughs> okay, merci, Amory. So last question, Mathieu. Yeah, thank you, Yvon, and, and, and thanks to Luca for the, the great talk. I, I, I had one reaction about uh, what Yvon was mentioning is, from what I understand, the, the app does not exactly function like a classical epidemics because you do not isolate contacts of contact. So there is no, the second generation is not exactly like the first. I mean, you do ask people that have been in contact to a suspected case that turns out, that might turn out to be a, a confirmed case to, to self-isolate, but you don't go to the contacts of the contacts right away unless there is other confirmed case. So I guess you cannot exactly treat it in the same way than an epidemics. So that, that, that was, if I'm correct, Luca, uh, yeah. about that. It, and it, it is correct. So w the reason why actually we didn't consider that uh, was just uh, to get uh, solvable equations uh, and, and in a short time, because of course uh, what was needed was also to have a short answer to the question, does it work? I think, uh, uh, so we have simulations that show that essentially some degree of recursion is better, but it's mostly recursion within households. So you, you, can inf you can essentially alert uh, the, the contacts and ask also their households to stay at home. Okay. Because of so course- So clo closer contacts. Okay, thank you. And I had I, the second, sure. uh, second question. I mean, briefly, maybe it's, uh, it's too vague. But I was stricken by the fact that there was such a big difference in estimation of the R0 for Asia and Europe. And it leads to, of course, uh, suspect some kind of cultural differences. Okay, or, or a different contact, the way of contacting people. But it could also be, I don't know if, uh, if that would be a, a possibility, but that if people are infectious on some very different levels, you mentioned that with the asymptomatic on one hand being less infectious or post-symptomatic being less infectious than others. It could also be that because the population is different, we're older, fatter, or whatever than the Asian uh, population, that there would be a, 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 a bigger proportion of the population that is actually more infectious when it gets the, the virus. And maybe it points to that. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not completely sure about that. But, okay. uh, so it is a possibility. There is, or at least there is a strong speculation that there is a, some core group effect uh, and we observe it in our simulations. It says that elderly tend to um, stay mostly with, the, with, the, with people of their age uh, and tend to have uh, more severe symptoms and probably more, uh, to be more effective. So there is, a, there is a strong impact of this group uh, that is uh, not as strong in China, but definitely stronger, for example, in Italy. Italy is one of the countries that have the highest proportion of uh, over 80s uh, in, uh, among, among, big, among large countries in the world. So definitely that is a possibility. There has been a paper that probably was discussing this in more detail by Lorenzo Pellis. Uh, I think the first author was Lorenzo Pellis. Uh, um, recently about precisely estimates of uh, growth rate and are not uh, and was was some way I think discussing this core growth effect so the fact that possibly they the growth is at some at some initial point the, the visible growth is dominated by essentially elderly people who show more inf who show um, higher infectivity and uh, and high susceptibility moreover and they tend to and they tend to be assortatively mixed uh, among their age classes so that, that's, that's, a, that's a, good, a good observation and it's definitely possible that it's true. I did not want to speculate too much. Uh, I mean, you know, there, are, there are some reasons for which I can see clearly that Europe could be culturally more affected, uh, like countries like Italy, but also France and Spain uh, have family gatherings with food, as, uh, for example. And uh, that, that's quite common, as you know, uh, but, but it's not that China doesn't have them. Uh, some countries like Spain have, for example, a larger, a much larger rate of physical contact. But again, uh, the difference is not impressive. So my feeling is that there could be differences of this kind that are more uh, in terms of the demographic structure that could explain it. The problem is that there are some in estimating these, uh, these quantities 
that I didn't want to delve deeply into what I think is there or not. I mean, honestly, I don't feel confident enough to make an assessment. Probably the values between 2.5, between 2 and 3.5, all the values are probably reasonable. And that is one of the reasons why I think an integrated strategy is key because we have an unknown value of a knot that we want to bring down to one. And so oh, there needs to be multiple strategies put together to make sure that we are covering all the uncertainties of this kind. Thanks a lot for the answer. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. It's noon. And uh, so I think that uh, uh, Luca uh, has a lot of things to do. So I thank him again for this uh, very nice uh, presentation and also for the, his availability to, to participate to this uh, group de travail. Okay. You're thank welcome. You all. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.